Good morning, folks. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are meeting this morning to uh, continue our deliberations on S-233, um, a bill uh, relating to uniform licensing standards that, uh, that the Senate GovOps Committee was nearly done with right before we shut down for, uh, for COVID. And so uh, we are uh, close to wrapping up some of the work that we're doing on our emergency COVID relief. So now we want to turn an eye towards um, towards these uh, OPR bills that will help Vermonters get back to work when we are reopening the economy. So um, <clears throat> we've got a couple of different folks with us this morning, and I wanted to start with Jason Malucci because Jason and Lauren Hibbert and I were a part of a uh, a, a delegation of Vermonters who went to an NCSL sponsored conference um, relating to this idea of uniform licensing. And so I wanted to give Jason an opportunity to, uh, to sort of frame up the context that, uh, that is coming from the administration on, on mm -hmm. this bill. And then we can proceed to hear from some folks from various professions. So Jason, thanks for being with us today. Good morning. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to join. Just for the record, Jason Malucci from the governor's office. We had a great time out in uh, Utah earlier, uh, end of last year. We learned a lot. And so just for a little background for how the governor's office got involved in these conversations, back in June or late June or early July of last year, the governor and I and a couple other staff were out in Utah as well in Salt Lake City for a National Governors Association meeting where uh, several governors, Governor Ducey from Arizona, Governor Wolf from Pennsylvania, were talking about how they were pursuing occupational licensing reform as an economic development tool. So it kind of piqued the governor's interest, and our office had had a great working relationship with, you know, the House and Senate Government Operations Committees and the uh, Office of Professional Regulation on, a OP, on an OPR bill for professional uh, licensing the previous year with regard to military reciprocity. So. Uh, the governor asked us to reach out to OPR to see what we could do um, to make it easier for people to get licensed here and reform our occupational licensing. We've had a great working uh, relationship with OPR and members of the government operations committees on this. So basically what, what the, this package does is four main things. And it, just to put it in a little bit further context, you know, we had a workforce challenge before this crisis with not enough people uh, to fill jobs that were available. And I think as we come out of this crisis and as the economy begins to slowly open up again, it's going to be, you know, we're going to have to redouble our efforts in terms of workforce development and making Vermont an attractive state for working for skilled professionals. Uh, for a little context as well, you know, 40 years ago, only one in 20 American workers required a government license or a government permission slip to work. And today it's 20% uh, of workers require some sort of, uh, sort of licensure. So what this package does is four things. Um, it makes it easier for people who have a license in other states to be licensed in Vermont. So it makes that process quicker for them with the general concept that if, if someone is you know, a, a nurse in another state or an electrician or a plumber and, and their standards are substantially similar, it's, it's safe for them to work here in Vermont and we need more people in those fields. So that's one aspect of it. The second piece is it allows um, military, it expands kind of the work that we did on uh, military a couple of years ago, allowing them to uh, more broadly receive recognition for the training and experience that they received in the armed services and applying that towards uh, their credentials for licensure in Vermont. Uh, the third piece is it gives a a second chance process um, to allow people with criminal backgrounds to receive or go through a predetermination process in order to see whether something in their criminal background would make them ineligible for a license. And the point there is to make sure that someone who has a criminal background who wants to, you know, pursue one of these professions doesn't waste a lot of time and money on education or other requirements just to get to the end of the process and learn that their background disqualifies them from that, from that licensing opportunity. So the point there is to try to give someone a little bit of comfort in the beginning of the process, whether what they've got in their background would disqualify them or not, so they can make an informed decision as to whether to you know, put themselves out there and 
and pursue that specific profession. And then the fourth major component requires uh, there to be a review every few years um, to look at continuing education requirements uh, to make sure that what is being asked of already licensed professionals in order, order to renew their license or get that continuing education is really necessary for public protection, which is obviously the, the you know, main point of licensure in the first place is to protect the public. So, and I think some of us have all sat through some continuing education requirements where you end up just having to click, click through a bunch of videos and then move on and you don't really get much out of it. So this is just an opportunity to, to make sure that every few years that that's being reviewed to ensure that it's relevant and helpful for the public protection mission of occupational licensure. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the broad overview. And again, I just really appreciate the hard work for, of uh, Office of Professional Regulation and Lauren Hibbert and her team They've done a great job on all of this, and we, we really value our working relationship on, on these issues. Great. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate it. Does uh, any committee members have questions for Jason about the, the context of the bill and, uh, and why it's being moved forward right now? All right. Not seeing any questions. Thank you, Jason. That was very helpful. Um, I think what I'd like to do now is jump over to David Herlihy, who is with us and his camera is off. So maybe he'll, maybe he'll join us when he hears his name. Hi, David. Thank you for being with us Hi, this morning. morning. Um, would love to hear your thoughts on F233 as it currently stands. Um, we don't have possession of it yet, but we, we hope to shortly. Um, yeah. So take it away, David. Yeah, so um, the Board of Medical Practice was uh, invited to, to um, um, be in uh, Senate Government Operations and uh, give its uh, input on the bill. And um, uh, as it was originally introduced, there were, there were some uh, technical issues um, that, that um, the board had some, some problems with. But, uh, our concerns were addressed. Um, the biggest one was that as, as written, um, you know, Jason mentioned having states with, um, that, that it's safe to have people come in uh, to Vermont when their standards are substantially similar to ours. And um, as written, it kind of did away with that concept, but we, um, we, we made some uh, adjustments in the Senate and uh, as it stands now, um, the uh, the board can can uh, live with the bill. Great. Questions from committee members. That was short and sweet. All right. I'm not seeing anybody diving for their hand to raise. So uh, please stick around with us. Um, well, Bob Hooper's got a got his hands up. Uh, Jim Harrison with the little blue hand. Go ahead, Jim, and then we'll go to Bob. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. David, um, it sounds like the issue you might have had or the board may have had in the Senate was addressed, but I'm, I'm just curious, um, and maybe it's my own lack of knowledge, but if you're a medical doctor and you've graduated um, from one of the country's medical institutions and done your residency, um, what states would be significantly different? Um, well, um, you know, the, the, um, there, is, there is variance uh, among the states on, on uh, some of the um, fundamental requirements. Some states um, actually don't require graduation from medical school. Uh, they only require a couple years of medical school, and if you manage to pass the exam, you can practice. Um, some states have um, lower requirements for the number of years of residency, and uh, so our requirements are are pretty much center mass for for you know uh, the mainstream of, of states. What's what's required? Maybe a, just a little bit on on the uh, more conservative high side of of that for, towards safety. We require. Uh, those who graduate from a U.S. medical or Canadian medical school to have at least two years of residency, whereas and um, foreign grads must have three years in, in a uh, 
uh, US or Canadian residency program. Some states uh, require uh, only one year of residency before someone can get a full license. Um, and the other thing is, you know, we, we um, do a pretty careful job of, of examining uh, people's backgrounds. Uh, and, and we do look at, uh, you know, the implications of criminal convictions and um, unprofessional conduct findings in other states. And, um, you know, Vermont is, um, there's, there's different ways of measuring it, but no, no matter how you measure it, we are uh, among the, the best situated of the states for our, our ratios of uh, providers to population. And there, there are states that are desperate for doctors uh, and, and that, you know, they're obviously, uh, they, they can't have the same high standards that we have here. So, um, you know, when, when you talk about accepting people in by endorsement, um, if they've, they've been in good standing for, you know, three or five years, whatever the, the test may be, um, that, you know, you can get some people that we might not otherwise uh, uh, have in the state. Great, that's um, very helpful. Um, um, I suspect we don't give credit for staying at a Holiday Inn Express um, in our past, right? No, no. No, okay. Um, well, I've seen it on TV and, you know, they can do most anything. Um, anyhow, um, if you had to estimate how many states this would allow to become licensed in Vermont if they relocated here, off the top of your head, what, I mean, are we talking 30 states, 50 states, uh, 10 states? Well, you know, first of all, with the with the with the board, um, you know, the there's a big factor that that kind of makes this um, a, a different conversation, and that's because uh, effective this year, we're participating in the interstate medical uh, licensing compact, and so there's about 30 states now have adopted that, and the, the way things are going, I, I think that number is only going to go up, and so okay. uh, the vast majority of, of states already. For the physicians who, who meet the, the criteria to participate in the compact uh, would be able to get a license here by the, the streamlined compact process. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that factors in as, as well. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd have to really take a, a close look. I mean, we, you know, that, that's something that um, I don't want to shoot from the hip. I'm, I'm guessing, it, you know, we're, we're probably, um, like I said, we're, we're, in center mass, maybe on the, the more conservative be, because of, of our, um, um, you know, we're not desperate in the, in the way some other states are for doctors. We've, we've had a little bit higher standards. So uh, I'm, I'm guessing that, that probably, you know, somewhere 60, 70% of the states probably would, would qualify. Okay, good. That's helpful. Thank you. Bob, did you have a question? Well, actually I had the same, uh, same question Jim had, but hearing the answer from David, hi David, uh, I'd love to see the list of which states allow you in with no medical school essentially, because that will impact my travel plans, I'm sure. Thank you. You're hoping it's not Florida, right? <laughs> well, yeah, uh, but quite frankly, it could be based on experience. Um, well, Florida's pretty tough. That's, a, that's kind of a, a semi-serious question, actually, because the broad range of things that we might get into is uh, uh, it's kind of an interesting point. And Madam Chair, if I may take a little liberty, I'd like to congratulate a member from Winooski for maintaining the proper uh, attire here. It's the only one today with a tie on. Oh, 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 Rob LeClaire wants points. Rob is wearing a tie, of course. And that slick military haircut that he's got. <clears throat> um, okay, so thank you, David. I appreciate your, um, your helping us understand your perspective on the bill. Um, any other committee members have a question for, for David with respect to the Board of Medical Practice? All right, I'm not seeing any. So I would love to invite Jessa Barnard from the Medical Society to share any perspective she would like to share with us. Good morning, Jessa, thanks for being with us. 
Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Nice to see everyone. It's been a little while since I've seen the faces of folks on this committee. Jessa Barnard with the Vermont Medical Society. We are the voluntary membership uh, organization for physicians and also physician assistants in the state. So our members are regulated by the Board of Medical Practice. So we followed the progress of the bill on the Senate side to see how the bill would impact board licensees. And I will really just echo what uh, David said. We follow, kind of followed the lead of the Board of Medical Practice on this bill. So we are uh, comfortable with where it left the Senate and feel like it both uh, adds some flexibility but maintains the high standard for licensure in the state. We had had an initial concern. There was a, there's a component around waiving fees for military service, and we were wondering how that might impact um, licensing fees for the rest of Vermont licensees. But after talking with the board, it sounds like that'll be a fairly small um, number of people and won't really impact existing licensees. So we are comfortable with where the, the bill is. Thank you. Committee, any more questions for the Medical Society's perspective? How? go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we all know that Vermont has a very small population growth, but majority of it is due to new Americans. And many of them who come to our community are professionals from their home country uh, with all kinds of credentials. So any sense on how many new Americans might be drawn into these professions based on this bill? I, I would actually defer to both the board and OPR on that question, just again, because since they're really the experts in how foreign credentials might translate into practice in the state, but it is a, it is a great question. We certainly support um, pathways for folks coming into the country to be able to practice here as well. Lauren or David, anything on that? Sure. Um, so with, with regard to MDs, um, I can say that um, consistently over the, the past uh, several years, uh, the number of physicians that are being licensed in the United States on a yearly basis runs uh, between about 25 and 30% of all physicians. So obviously, you know, foreign educated physicians are a critical component to maintaining uh, uh, the necessary number of, of uh, medical practitioners in the United States. And uh, there, there is a robust system for uh, um, ad administering that, that process. Um, so I can take a minute and explain what it is, but uh, if you like, or um, just leave it at that. We, you know, Vermont uh, looks like much of the rest of the, the nation. Um, we have very many uh, of the, um, uh, new licensees are, are people who trained overseas. And, and when I say foreign medical graduates, that includes both Americans who choose to go abroad um, and uh, uh, people who grew up and, and went to school overseas and then decided they want to come here. Uh, there is um, uh, a, a group that's the, the um, um, uh, single recognized um, uh, entity that uh, is involved with uh, verifying the, the bona fides of people who went overseas, uh, making sure their diplomas are genuine and that they're uh, appropriate programs and they evaluate the, the training of programs. Uh, and um, the US uh, MLE, the United States Medical Licensing Exam, which is used by all jurisdictions now, um, uh, serves also as uh, a competency uh, in, in English language skills sufficient to practice. So um, yeah, it's it's a big part of the of the landscape, and uh, it's going to continue to be a big part. And uh, this um, is is not going to impair that in any way. Thank you, Lauren. Anything to add on that? I'll just say that um, one reason why I think S two thirty three is a great bill is it radiates the work that was done in H four twenty seven last year um, into the other licensing silos. Um, particularly education and public safety. So um, I forget whether that included medical practice. Um, I believe that it does not, but I'll look to David or um, Betsy Ann to clarify that um, in large part because the medical um, 
professionals have really worked out foreign credentialing in a way that many other um, professions have not streamlined as effectively. But um, one thing that is, I think, a crucial part of uh, S233 is that those principles from H427 are radiated through the other licensing silos. And I can speak for OPR since 427 has been enacted. We have um, utilized um, that bill. I think we're now up to six people um, getting them credentialed with pathways that would not have been easily uh, found before that bill happened. So thank you very much, Representative Colston. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, any other committee members have questions for either Jessa or David or anything over to Lauren? All right. Super. So um, what I think I'd like to do at this point is have Betsy Ann uh, take us on um, on a slightly more focused trip through the language of the bill. And uh, as you all saw, there is um, a nice summary of the bill that Betsy Ann has provided for us on our committee page. And you can find the language of the bill there as well. Hi, good morning. Uh, Andrea, am I able to do, oh, you already have me as co-host. Um, Madam Chair, do you want me to do share screen or would you rather that I just direct the committee to the documents that we'll be discussing or that I'll, I'll be reviewing with you? So I will, I'll defer to the committee. Um, if you prefer to have share screen so that you're following along and not watching people talking, uh, give me a wave if you prefer share screen. If you prefer to do it on your own separate device and stay on Zoom on this device, give me a wave. Okay, I think uh, I think that 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 determines who who how we prefer to do our work. So go ahead and uh, assume that we're following along. Great. Well, let's turn together to the uh, summary, just so that it we can look together at the main points of this bill. Um, so as you've already heard, and thank you to Andrea for posting that, it is on your uh, uh, web page under today's date. So we're looking at that S2 summary of S233 as recommended by Senate GovOps. I'll just give you an update. Um, Senate GovOps did vote out the bill uh, with a strike all amendment. And the bill is currently in Senate Finance and Senate Finance is scheduled to discuss the bill again this afternoon. Um, but the main provisions are addressed here in this summary. And as already described, this bill was um, originated as a joint proposal um, by OPR and the administration. And it would cover these specified professional regulatory entities that are described at the top of this summary. It would include OPR, the Department of Environmental Conservation for Well Drillers, the Standards Board for Professional Educators, the Electrician's Licensing Board, the Board of Medical Practice, and the Plumber's Examining Board. And so all of those professional regula re regulatory entities would be required by the bill to create uniform standards for their licensure processes in regard to the following areas that are specified here, but in a manner that's tailored to each entity's professional regulatory structure which would include the way that their statutes are set up and also ultimately who should have decision-making on some of these um, areas. So the first area that the bill covers is military credentials and fees. Uh, the bill would allow these entities to evaluate specific military credentials to determine equivalency to the credentials required for Vermont licensure. And that's a little different from what the General Assembly has done in the past, which was um, for some of these entities to require them to have a general process for determining equivalence for military credentials. But this is getting into more a nitty gritty analysis of specific military credentials to see whether that would um, qualify a person for licensure here. And then also in regard to um, military background, um, this would require each of these entities to establish qualifications and procedures by which the entity would waive application fees to qualified military members and spouses. 
The second area that this bill covers is criminal backgrounds, um, requiring these entities to provide a pre-application determination of an applicant's criminal background. It's also called a second chance determination request um, as it relates to the professions for which the applicant may thereafter seek licensure. So how this would work for all of these entities, um, an applicant would pay a $25 fee and essentially provide information on the person's criminal background and any rehabilitation from it, um, other things that the board, the entity should consider in order to learn whether the criminal background would be a disqualifier for the person to seek licensure. And the big idea is to get an idea of whether um, their criminal background would be a disqualifier before the applicant goes through the process and um, expense of getting any necessary education or other um, experience in order to get licensed um, according to the qualifications for licensure. The language currently provides that this um, second chance determination is not binding if the applicant thereafter violates probation or parole or is convicted of another crime following that determination. Um, but if the individual does thereafter seek licensure, um, that $25 that they paid would be deducted from their license application fee. The third area is that sunset review that was already discussed. This would require each of these entities um, to conduct a sunset review at least once every five years regarding the profession's continuing competency requirements in order to determine whether those requirements should be reduced or otherwise modified, um, whether they're necessary to protect the public essentially. Um, the, the next area is that endorsement uh, procedure for based on practice in other states. This would require each entity to have an endorsement process for licensure that requires not more than three years of practice in good standing in another US jurisdiction, regardless of whether that jurisdiction has licensing requirements substantially similar to those of this state. So the idea is to um, allow for licensure based on three years of good practice in another state, but there are exceptions that are allowed um, for example, an entity could determine that a certain jurisdiction um, doesn't have uh, robust enough qualifications for licensure that three years would um, be a good enough standard to allow for licensure by endorsement. And then there's also, on the other hand, an uh, authorization to waive uh, the profession's practice requirement. For example, if maybe you don't need a full three years practice in another state, um, if uh, it would still follow state policy to allow um, the person to be licensed, even though they don't have the minimum practice requirement in another jurisdiction. And then finally, the last topic covered is that foreign credential verification, as the director of OPR already discussed, the H-427, um, which was proposed by Representative Colston, was enacted into law for OPR, and this uh, requires a process to assess the equivalence of an applicant's pro professional credentials earned outside the U.S. as compared to those in Vermont, um, and the authorization to have a third-party credential verification service, and so that language would be applied to all of these other professional and uh, regulatory entities. So those are the main provisions of the bill, but each, as the language gets added to each of the statutes, um, it is tailored to each entity's regulation. So while well, these are uniform standards for all of these entities, the language might uh, be tweaked a little bit to fit how they regulate their professionals. So if you do wanna go into that, uh, Madam Chair, I'll just ask now for the committee members to pull up the Senate GovOps strike all, that draft 3.1 that Andrea posted for you. Great, Jim Harrison has a question while folks are shifting over to that document. Um, hi, Betsy Ann. Um, I may find my answer when I pull up the uh, actual bill, but uh, I'm curious, you know, I'm looking at the last one, the for, foreign credential verification, for example, um, we're requiring uh, these various entities, whether it's OPR or the lic electrician's licensing board, um, et cetera, um, to have a process uh, to look at the um, licensing for foreign um, 
experience. And, and that's all great and, and support that. And we passed a, a bill similar to that last year. I'm just wondering, has when is this effective or when does this have to be done by? Uh, I'm, a, I'm sensitive to, um, you know, we've already uh, putting forth a administration's put forth a what's so-called skinny budget with an 8% reduction. And uh, that very well could mean staff reductions uh, to get at that 8%. So are we putting any unrealistic um, requirements on any agencies for doing this? Or is the date out there um, far enough that it's not a problem? So for, I think, all or almost all of these professional regulatory entities, the requirement to have that uh, process for foreign credential verification is by rule. And the very last or second to last section of the bill, strike all, Senate GovOps strike all, provides that the rulemaking deadline is July 1, 2021 unless that deadline is extended by LCAR pursuant to the LCAR review process. So I think if not for all, almost all, um, if this requirement for foreign credential equivalence is by rule, that those rules would have to be adopted by next July 1, 2021. Which okay, means they so have to get started um, at least, usually allow six to eight months at least for rulemaking to go through the process. Yeah, and, and, and I get, and it may not be a very big issue at all. It's just, I, I just want to flag it because um, if we adopt that, that means they've got to start on that uh, in the next couple months of going through this. Uh, and we just don't know what that last three quarters budget is going to look like at this. It may be fine. We may get some federal help, but right now we just don't know. So I just want to flag that. Thank you. Note it. Yeah, and that's certainly, um, that's certainly a dynamic that we want to be sensitive to. On the other hand, we also want to make sure that, um, that we can get people back to work as quickly as possible. Um, and that includes folks who may be new to Vermont. Vermont's uh, not a bad place to live, you know? <laughs> All right, go ahead, Betsy Ann. All right, so the way that this bill is set up is it just goes by the statutes of each professional regulatory entity. So it starts out with OPR statutes, which are set forth in Title III. So I'm going to scroll through to page two, where we get to the first requirement, um, which, or authorization here, which on page two is to allow the director of OPR to evaluate specific military credentials to determine equivalency to credentials required for OPR professions. And those determinations, how the director would go about doing that would be adopted through a written policy that's posted on OPR's website. Then all here on page two, um, also, on line 12, we get into the other topic, the, uh, the other topic of that second chance determination about a per person's criminal background. So this language here in new subsection K would be saying for any OPR profession, OPR shall provide a pre-application determination of an individual's criminal background. It wouldn't be binding on OPR in a future application if the individual violates probation or parole or is convicted of another crime following the determination. Goes on to describe how this would work. Um, OPR would initiate this determination upon an indi individual's second chance determination request. The request would have to provide documentation related to the individual's conviction or convictions, evidence of rehabilitation, and an identification of the profession or professions for which the person would seek licensure. Top of page three, individual would be required to submit this request online, accompanied by the fee that's set forth in OPR's fee statute. For all of these entities, this fee would be $25. And for all entities, and here specifically for OPR, if the individual thereafter applies for licensure, that $25 pre-application fee would be and would be required to be 
deducted from that license application fee. All of these entities have the same process. OPR would have to process one of these requests within 30 days of receiving a complete one and assess the nature of the underlying conviction or convictions, the nexus to the profession or professions for which the individual might seek licensure, and the provided evidence of rehabilitation, and then respond in writing. You'll see this repeated in similar language throughout the bill. I am moving down to section two. We're still in OPR. Um, now at the top of page four, and there's that $25 fee for that second chance determination request. And then on page four, line four is a separate topic. Um, this is about the military qualifications. Um, this language provides pursuant to qualifications and procedures determined by the director of OPR, the office would be required to waive upon request application fees for qualified military members and military spouses. So for all of these entities, the entity would determine what the qualifications would be in the procedures to waive these fees. And then if a applicant met, tho met those qualifications, the entity would be required to waive fees for qualified military members and military spouses. Moving on to uh, another topic of the bill, those sunset reviews. This is in regard to evaluating the ongoing need for continuing competency requirements, such as continuing education or a certain amount of um, experience or practice. We're still in OPR. Um, this language is saying not less than once every five years, each profession attached to OPR, and there are approximately 50, uh, 40, 47 to 50 around there, each profession would be required to review its continuing education or other continuing competency requirements and um, provide there's uh, a manner in which this review has to be done. The review would have to be in writing and address these um, different items. What the renewal requirements are for this profession in Vermont. B, what the renewal requirements in other jurisdictions are, particularly in the Northeast. I'm at the top of page five, what the cost of the renewal requirements are for the licensees, um, an analysis of the utility and effectiveness of the renewal requirements with respect to public protection, because remember that's the basic principle of professional regulation is to protect the public. And then finally, recommendations to the director of OPR on whether the continuing education or other continuing competency requirements should be modified. So these, at least as far as OPR structure would be, each profession would conduct this analysis and then provide the information to the director. Um, the director would be required to respond to the profession, which within 45 days of the submitted review results. And then after reviewing that, the director of OPR may require a profession to reduce, modify, or otherwise change the renewal requirements, um, including by proposing any necessary amendments to statute or rule. So at least for how OPR is set up, there's the director of OPR and the professions would need to submit that info to the director and then the director would make a determination and may seek um, some amendments to the law in light of this sunset analysis. All right, we're on section four, still within OPR. We're moving on to another topic of the bill, which is that endorsement process for licensure based on practice in other states. Um, one thing to just point out here, this is only in regard to practice in other states of the United States, not outside of the United States. Um, and this language says, except as provided in subsection B, which we'll get to in a moment, all professions attach the office shall have an endorsement process that requires not more than three years of practice in good standing in another jurisdiction within the United States, regardless of whether that jurisdiction has licensing requirements substantially sim similar to those of Vermont. So in good standing means, um, the director can correct me if I'm wrong, that it, it's without 
um, major discipline on your license, for example. You didn't have your uh, license revoked at some point during those three years of practice, for example. But if you met those three years of practice in good standing in another US jurisdiction, that would qualify you for licensure. Now, subsection B uh, provides some exceptions. Uh, the profession might determine that three years of practice in another jurisdiction is not adequ adequately protective of the public. Um, if that's the case, the profession would provide its rationale to the director as to why it doesn't believe that that three years of practice is enough to grant licensure here because it would may harm public protection. And the director in turn um, may propose any ne necessary, necessary statutory or rule amendments in order to implement more restrictive requirements for endorsement. And this perhaps could look, you know, if for example, if state X just does not have really robust requirements for licensure in the, to be able to practice a profession, for example, that might be a reason why the profession here in Vermont would say, coming from state <laughs> X, we don't think that it's uh, protective of the public to allow licensure just based on three years of practice in state X because State X has very minimal qualifications for licensure, for example. Here on page six, line three, subsection C is on the other hand, um, the director may issue to an endorsement applicant a waiver of the profession's practi practice requirement if there's a showing that the waiver follows state policy and the public is adequately protective. A couple things to note here, this is just tailoring this to OPR's regulatory structure, where it would be the director of OPR and not, for example, a board um, that would be able to issue these waivers. And so this might be a case where, all right, the person from another state doesn't have three years of practice, but um, maybe they have two and a half or two, and they have satisfied the director's um, analysis that licensing the person based on that two or two and a half years of practice, for example, um, should be permitted because the person has enough experience to get licensed here and practice safely, for example. Uh, just a note here, of course, like we already discussed, we're going, we're at the end of the OPR provision and they don't have that foreign credential verification because you already enacted it into law. So we're moving on to well drillers here on page six in section five. And that's gonna- Deanna, can oh, I interrupt you for just a moment? Um, sure. Juan Gannon has a question. Thank you. Um, Betsy Ann, could you just clarify, um, I, I know somebody can dis disclose a criminal background and that um, OPR will look at it, um, th but this bill does not address the issue of requiring criminal background checks for every pr profession licensed by OPR. You are correct. Um, for example, and this is uh, an issue that's being discussed in Senate Finance. We are reviewing this issue about these what it really means for these uh, pre-application determinations. So for example, for OPR, I think there's four professions that OPR regulates that actually the General Assembly has allowed OPR to conduct criminal background checks. That's only four of the total of approximately 50 professions that OPR regulates. So, but for all of the OPR professions, this pre-application determination would apply. It would be expected that the person would provide an accurate accounting of the person's criminal background or history. Um, if the person thereafter seeks licensure, I believe it's a standard um, question on a license application to require a person to disclose if they had any criminal um, convictions in their past. Um, for those OPR professions where the General Assembly has not allowed a criminal background check, um, OPR would not be allowed to conduct one. Um, it would just, their licensure, the uh, whether to grant the license would be based on the criminal background history that the applicant provided. But it is at least possible for OPR may find out in other ways that the person lied on the application, for example, um, and um, submitting fraudulent um, information to OPR um, is unprofessional conduct. So if OPR and the director of OPR can weigh in again, um, but we had just recently discussed this in another committee, um, 
if OPR found that it was not accurate information that the person was uh, providing about their criminal background, um, it could be a reason to deny the license application initially, or if the person actually did get licensed and OPR later learned that the person was not, uh, didn't provide truthful information, it could be a reason to discipline the person's license. So, so this bill is gonna to apply to initial licensing correct with respect to the disclosure of criminal background. If yes. somebody already holds a license under OPR and they're just renewing their license, do they have to make the same disclosure? Well, let's ask uh, the director of OPR for sure. I think she'd be the best resource. For the record, Lauren Hibbert, director of the Office of Professional Regulation. Um, we ask whether you have been arrested or convicted of a misdemeanor or felony outside of a traffic um, infraction in both our initial application and our renewal application. And this bill would not change that. And everything else that um, Betsy Ann said is correct about the implications of this bill on our process. Okay. Uh, um, Lauren, as you know, I'm very concerned about sexual predators um, being licensed in Vermont and our lack of ability to identify them. Um, as you know, in Massachusetts, they discovered that they had many licensees um, who were registered sexual predators. Um, and, you know, I just think that that issue still needs to be resolved. I Thank do you. not disagree with you. Um, and unfortunately, this bill does not resolve that. Um, and we've looked at the issue of, look, of comparing the um, sex abuse registry with our licensee list and or requiring more criminal background checks. Um, and those are conversations that we need to have with the Department of Public Safety um, and probably put through, um, certainly have, if more professions need to be criminally background checked, um, that would be through a legislative process. We would need authorization to do that. And I think that we would need authorization to check the, the sex abuse registry if we were doing anything that was not posted publicly. Um, so I need to have a conversation with public safety on that issue. And I am committed to having that conversation before the next legislative session, Representative Gannon. Thank you. Sure. All right, I have Marcia Gardner and then Mike Merwicki. Thank you. I think this is a question for Lauren uh, about the sunset review. I believe it said in the bill that, or the proposal that the director will review these reports. Um, I'm wondering if that's workable for you with 47 or 50 different occupations and how you would go about uh, looking at these reports. Would you ask others to come in and help you with that review? Yes, I would. Um, I would expect that we put these on a staggered schedule so they wouldn't all come due at the same time. Um, and all of our professions do not have continuing education. Um, I think it's about two thirds of them do. Um, and then um, I would obviously rely on my um, very excellent staff to help me um, review these. And I anticipate that most of the boards will find um, that their continuing education is appropriate. Um, because um, some of our boards um, are very committed to their continuing education. And I think that's where it could be a little tricky is if there's no demonstration of um, value, then we'll have to have a conversation. And that's where the majority of the work would come in. Thank you. Sure. And Mike. Uh, just to follow up on John's concern, I, I, I share that concern. And uh, as someone who works in child protection, um, we are regularly aware that we need to do a better job. Um, one of those things that we have done recently is, is um, we've opened up better communications with other states in that it used to be we would do a background check that would be limited to Vermont. And there's now a better system of us being able to check other states um, and whether somebody has such a, a record in, in other states. Uh, I would agree that this is something we need to look at and perhaps 
expand um, who who gets a background check and, uh, and when that happens. So I'm, I'm certainly open to that kind of conversation as well. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. All right. Go I'm going to keep going. We're on page six, and now we're getting into well drillers. Uh, well drillers are regulated by the Department of Environmental Conservation. I'm going to start sounding pretty repetitive because this is uniform licensing standards, so we're covering the same topics. Um, but I'll just note again that each one is tailored to each regulatory entity structure, so the language um, does get tweaked a little bit for to apply each of these uniform standards in a manner that fits the regulatory structure. So I'm here on page six, section five, in regard to well drillers. Uh, moving on to page seven, the first topic covered is the criminal background, the pre-application determination. This requires DEC to provide that um, to an individual to get that second chance determination um, uh, on the person's criminal background history. Again, the determination would not be binding on DEC in a future application if the individual violates probation or parole or has another conviction. Um, it's the same type of language that you already reviewed in regard to OPR. Um, person would still have to provide documentation relating to their convictions and evidence of rehabilitation. It needs to be completed online with a payment of a $25 fee. And again, if the person thereafter applies for licensure, that $25 fee gets deducted from that future application fee. Same process, time frame, process a request within 30 days of receiving one, assess the nature of the underlying convictions, nexus to the well drilling profession, and the provided evidence of rehabilitation and respond in writing. Page eight, line two, we get into the next topic of that sunset review. Again, not less than once every five years, DEC would have to review its continuing ed or other continuing competency requirements for well drillers and look at those same uh, criteria. What the renewal requirements are, what they are like in other states, particularly the Northeast, the cost, and analysis of the utility and effectiveness of the renewal requirements with respect to public protection, and then recommend to the secretary of ANR on whether those continuing competency requirements should be modified. Secretary would respond to DEC within 45 days, and then the secretary may require the department to renew, reduce, modify, or otherwise change the renewal requirements including by proposing any amendments to statute or rule. So similar to OPR, where the secretary of ANR has the ultimate authority um, in regard to the co continuing competency review like the director of OPR does. Um, bottom of page eight here is the evaluation of specific military credentials to determine the equivalence to credentials for well drillers. Those determinations would need to be adopted through written policy posted on the department's website. And next topic here, still for well drillers, that uniform process for endorsement from other states where the department would be required to issue licenses for well drillers who've been licensed in good standing in another US state for at least three years, regardless of whether that state has licensing requirements substantially similar to Vermont. Um, similarly, if the department determines three years is not adequately protected, it would provide its rationale to the secretary who may propose necessary statutory or rule amendments to implement more restrictive requirements for that jurisdiction. Same thing that was provided for OPR. But on the flip side, again, um, the secretary would be authorized to issue to an endorsement applicant a waiver if the practice requirement um, is too stringent and there's a for this person who could show that the waiver um, follows state policy and the public is adequately protected. For example, if they don't have the full three years, um, but the secretary of ANR determines that licensure um, would not be a risk to the public protection. And then I think finally here at the bottom of page 10 is the requirement to have a uniform process for foreign credential verification. So it would be the secretary of ANR adopting rules in consultation with DEC to prescribe a process for the secretary to assess the equivalence of an applicant's professional credentials earned outside the US as compared to those for Vermont's licensing requirements for well drillers. Um, 
any determination of equivalence by the secretary would be in consultation with the department, um, recorded in the applicant's licensing file and binding on the department, and the secretary would rely on third party, could rely on third party credential services, and those services, the cost would be paid by the applicant. So that's similar to how that already works for the law enacted for OPR. I'll just note that the one thing that uh, we noticed um, does not is not provided here for well drillers is that requirement to develop qualifications and procedures um, to waive fees for qualified military applicants and spouses. Um, that was caught on the Senate side. It's my understanding Senate Finance is likely to introduce an amendment to make that uniform for well drillers. It was just an oversight that that wasn't provided there for that profession, but should be included by the time the bill leaves the Senate. Now, I'm on page 11. We're now moving into the professional educators uh, practice professionals. So tailored to the education statutes, here is the requirement for the standards board for professional educators, which generally regulates our educators to have that continuing the sunset review so that not less than once every five years, the standards board would review its continuing education or other continuing competency requirements for professional educators. Um, they'd have to put in writing their results, which would need to address the renewal requirements, the renewal requirements of other jurisdictions, particularly the new, uh, Northeast, the cost of renewal and analysis of the utility and effectiveness of the renewal requirements. Um, and a special uh, language tweak specifically for the education profession with respect to the purpose set forth in a section, another section of law, which describes the purpose of regulating educators and the state policy. On page 12, we're still with educators. Here on line seven is the requirement to adopt rules for an application process to provide licensure to applicants who can demonstrate three years or more of practice in good standing in another jurisdiction within the US, regardless of whether that jurisdiction has substantially similar requirements for licensure. So there's that uniform process for licensure by endorsement based on three years of practice in another jurisdiction. But language here on line 11 saying that the standards board may by rule exclude an endorsement from the process if it finds that licensure by arrest for the not fulfill this legal standards. So this language is specially, um, specially tweaked for educators um, and that was based on feedback from um, Agency of Education. Here at the bottom of page 12 is the um, authority for the standards board by adoption of a written policy that's posted on AOE's website to allow specific military credentials to satisfy one or more requirements for licensure. That's the military credentials aspect. On page 13, section seven, um, this begins the uh, new language to require the agency of education to have that pre-application determination in regard to a person's criminal background. It's very similar to the language you've already reviewed. Um, providing specifically that the results of the pre-application determination is not binding on the secretary in a future application. So that's a little different because the language is uh, not exact as the other ones that we've already reviewed saying it's not binding if the person commits another conviction, um, for example, or violates probation or parole. But this was based on feedback from AOE. Um, and I think that language here, the pre-application determination shall adhere to the process set forth in section 254 of this title, if I'm remembering correctly, that's, um, I believe it's piggybacking on language that's talking about, um, uh, let's see, before I say, I'll need to look that up and get back, I, I'll verify, I'll confirm for you um, exactly what that's referring to, that cross-reference, I need to remind myself, but I'll circle back to that. But the process for the person to submit this information is the same. Um, they had a person who wants to apply for the second chance termination re uh, request. Um, would it need to provide documentation relating to their criminal conviction or substantiation 
um, evidence of rehabilitation or mitigation, and identification of the license and any endorsement the individual will seek. This is education specific language. Um, I think substantiation here, I believe that is in regard to um, uh, exploitation of a child, for example, or perhaps a, a vulnerable adult. So a, a slightly, slightly tweaked language from the other professional regulatory entities. But it goes on to provide here on line 14, some similar language. It'd have to, this, uh, an applicant would need to just complete a form, uh, submit the fee. Um, it cross-references a fee statute, which we'll get to in a second, but it is that $25 fee. And if the person thereafter applies for licensure, that pre-application fee would be deducted from the license fee. Secretary of AOE would need to process such a request within 30 days assess the nature of the convictions or substantiation, the nexus to the license and endorsement sought, and the provided evidence of rehabilitation or mitigation, and then respond in writing as to whether the individual may seek licensure. Then we move on to the next topic, which is that uniform process for foreign credential verification. Um, here, the secretary of AOE would need to adopt rules in consultation with the standards board that prescribe a process for the secretary to assess the equivalence of an applicant's professional credentials earned outside the US as compared to those for Vermont licensure as a professional educator. Um, here, some education specific language, um, a determination of equivalence by the secretary would need to be in consultation with the standards board recorded in the licensing file and binding on the board and allowing the secretary to rely on third party credential verification services with the cost of those services paid by the applicant that's consistent with the OPR law. Um, and here at the bottom is language um, saying that uh, preliminary license denials apply to a license application. Um, if there is a determination of non-equivalence, that just means that the person um, appeals that they have the burden of showing um, at the appeal that they actually should have met those, they did meet those qualifications. Page 15, section eight, there's that $25 fee for that pre-application criminal background determination on line six and then on line seven um, is language saying pursuant to qualifications and procedures determined by the secretary of AOE, the agency shall upon request waive application fees to qualified military members and spouses. So you see how there's a little bit of a distinction where it's the secretary level, the agency level that's uh, waiving those fees, not the standards board level. And that was just a fit within educators specific regulatory structure. Then we move into the electrician's profession here on page 15. I am moving on to page 16 where we start the first substantive topic, which is that criminal background pre-application determination here it's the electrician's board that would provide this to applicants. Um, not binding on the electrician's board in a future application if the individual violates probation or parole or has another conviction. Um, it's a second chance determination request that triggers this. The person would have to provide their documentations relating to their convictions and evidence of rehabilitation. That's consistent language. Have to submit it online, pay the fee. $25, that fee set forth in another statute. And at the top of page 17, if the person thereafter does apply for licensure, the pre-application fee is deducted from the license application fee. It's the consistent process where the board, the electrician's board would process these within 30 days, assess the nature of the convictions, nexus to the electrician profession and provided evidence of rehabilitation and then respond in writing. And we get to that sunset review process um, here on line 10 that not less than once every five years again, the board would need to review electricians continuing ed education or other competency requirements, provide those results in writing, address the same criteria. And then here at the bottom of page 18, how it would work for the electricians board is that they would provide their recommendations to the commissioner of public safety because the electrician's board is under the public safety umbrella as to whether the continuing 
education or other competency requirements should be modified. And then commissioner would respond to the board within 45 days. And the commissioner may require the board to reduce, modify, or otherwise change those renewal requirements, including by proposing any necessary amendments to statute or rule. So similar to the OPR structure where there's a, a, the higher level review of those requirements. We're on section 10 here, line five. Um, first, for electricians, it's setting out that $25 fee for the pre-application criminal background determination. And then language here on line 10 saying that pursuant to qualifications and procedures determined by the Commissioner of Public Safety, the board shall, upon request, waive application fees for qualified military members and military spouses. So that's just tailored to their professional regulatory structure where the commissioner would determine the qualifications and then the board would be the one to waive the fees if a person met those qualifications as a military member or spouse. All right, I'm on page 19. We're still about talking about electricians. Here's the electrician's uniform process for endorsement from other states um, and starting the requirement of the board would need to issue uh, a license to master and journeyman electricians who've been licensed in good standing in another jurisdiction within the United States for at least three years, regardless of whether the jurisdiction meets the reciprocity, reciprocity requirements of subdivision one of this section. So here's where it's uh, tailored specifically to the electrician profession, because if you look starting at the bottom of page um, 18 on line 19, uh, in order to have licensure by endorsement here in Vermont for electricians, it's based, a condition of that um, licensure by endorsement is based on reciprocity, uh, where that other state um, would also license uh, electricians from Vermont in that, their state. So this language on page 19 is saying, regardless of whether that other state agrees to have a reciprocity um, agreement with Vermont, um, a person can get licensed by endorsement as an electrician based on three years of practice and good standing in another US jurisdiction. But here on line 10, it does say that if the board determines that three years of demonstrated practice in another jurisdiction is not adequately protected of the public, for example, that state X has really lax qualifications for licensure, um, it is possible um, the board would provide its rationale to the commissioner expressing those concerns and then the commissioner may propose any necessary statutory or rule amendments in order to implement more restrictive requirements for endorsement for that jurisdiction. But on the flip side, the commissioner of public safety could issue an endorsement applicant a waiver of the practice requirement if there's a showing that the waiver follows state policy, the public's adequately protected. So even if they didn't have the three years of practice person may be able to get a waiver of that requirement. We can skip ahead to the top of page 21, still in regard to electricians. Here is the authority for the electricians board to evaluate spe specific military credentials to determine equivalence to those credentials within the board's jurisdiction. Um, the determinations would be adopted through written policy posted on the electricians board website. And then finally here on line five is um, the requirement for the commissioner of public safety to adopt rules in consultation with the board that prescribe a process for the commissioner of public safety to assess the equivalence of an applicant's professional credentials earned outside the US as compared to those for licensure in Vermont as an electrician. Um, and any determination of equivalence by the commissioner um, would need to be in consultation with the electrician board recorded in the applicant's licensing file and binding on the board. And the board could rely on third party credential verification services to conduct that foreign credential um, evaluation. Those costs paid by the applicant. We're moving into the professions regulated by the board of medical practice are physicians, physician assistants, anesthesiologist assistants, and podiatrists. Um, so here, as the executive director of the board had already testified, this is tailored to, uh, uh, based on feedback from the board. Um, the language here in section 13 starts out with the pre-application determination of a person's criminal background. 
not binding on the board of medical practice if the individual thereafter violates probation or parole or has another conviction. It gets, um, the applicant needs to submit the second deter chance determination request, provide the same info, documentation related to their conviction, evidence of rehab, and identification of the profession that they want to get licensure. Um, submit the request online. It's, they have to pay that pre-application fee. It's cross-referenced to the board's uh, fee statute, but it is $25. We'll see that in a moment. Um, and then again, if the person does apply for licensure, ultimately that 25 bucks would get deducted from their license application fee. Same process, board would have to um, process one of these requests within 30 days, assess the nature of the conviction, the nexus to the profession, and the provided evidence of rehab and respond in writing. Then I'm moving to the bottom of page 22 top of page 23. Um, we're getting into military credentials. Um, and this is a slightly different from some of the other language in the bill. Um, we're starting off first with the requirement for the board to establish uniform procedures applicable to all of the board's professions under its jurisdiction, providing for, at the top of page 23, appropriate recognition of education, training, or service completed by a member of the US Armed Forces toward the requirements for licensure, to have an expedited issuance of professional license to a person who is licensed in good standing in another regulatory jurisdiction and who has a spouse who's a member of the Armed Forces and who has been subject to a military transfer to Vermont and who left employment to accompany his or her spouse to Vermont. Um, this is sometimes referred to as the trailing spouse um, who follows um, his or her spouse um, who's in the military here to Vermont and there's an authority for the person to get license um, based on uh, to have for the board to have a process to license these folks. Um, this language it doesn't appear in other parts of the bill but this was this is language that's already the law for OPR and um, this was the board had agreed to including this language for the board professions. But similar to the other provisions of this bill here on line 10 of page 23 is the additional requirement that's uniform for all of the other professions for the board to evaluate specific military credentials to determine equivalence to credentials within the board's jurisdiction and uh, adopt those determinations through a written policy that's posted on the board's website. On line 14 here is the requirement to have the foreign credential verification where the board would have to adopt rules that prescribe a process for the board to assess the equivalence of an applicant's professional credentials earned outside the US as compared to those for Vermont licensure by the board. Um, a determination of equivalence would be recorded in the applicant's licensing file and the board would be authorized to rely upon third party credential verification services with the cost paid by the applicant. Page 24, line four is the other topic of the sunset review where the board of medical practice would be required to conduct this review once every five years at least to review the board's continuing ed or other competency requirements for each of the, its professions. Um, again, same criteria. What are the renewal requirements? What are renewal requirements of other jurisdictions, particularly the Northeast? What's the cost? And an analysis of the utility and effectiveness of the renewal. Um, in regard to public protection. And then the board would recommend the commissioner of health on whether the continuing ed or other continuing competency requirements should be modified. So the commissioner of health, like the director of OPR would have to respond to the board within 45 days. And the commissioner of health could require the board to reduce, modify, or otherwise change those renewal requirements, including by proposing necessary amendments to statute or rule. I'm on page 25, section 14. This is getting into the endorsement process based on practice in another US jurisdiction. If you recall the executive director said that the board had requested some tweaks to the language so it fits what the board was comfortable with for licensure by endorsement. This section 14 is specifically in regard to podiatrists. 
So here is language here on line 11 saying that the board shall have an endorsement process that requires not more than three years of practice in good standing in another jurisdiction within the US, regardless of whether that jurisdiction has requirements substantially equal to those of Vermont. And then it provides board specific language. So long as the applicant meets one of the following postgraduate training requirements. And this is what the executive director was referring to earlier. The board is willing to license people by endorsement based on three years of practice in another US jurisdiction, provided the person can meet one of these two conditions that start on line 16. If they're a graduate of a US or Canadian podiatric school accredited by a body that's acceptable to the board, they have to have completed at least two years of postgraduate training in a US or Canadian program accredited by an organization that's acceptable to the board. Or if the person is a graduate of a board approved podiatric school outside the US or Canada, the person has to have completed at least three years of postgraduate training in a US or Canadian program accredited by an organization that's acceptable to the board. So those are bo specific board um, requirements for endorsement, licensure by endorsement. But here on page 26, it does go on on line three to say, if the board does determine that three years of demonstrated practice in another jurisdiction is not adequately protective of the public, it would provide its rationale to the commissioner of health who may propose any necessary amendments in order to implement more restrictive requirements for endorsement from that jurisdiction. For example, the state X who doesn't have um, the, the, the board doesn't finds that does not have um, adequate qualifications for licensure. Um, but on the flip side, the board could also issue to an endorsement applicant a waiver of the practice requirement if it shows there's a showing the waiver follows state policy, public's adequately protected. I'm going to pause. Uh, the speaker has a question. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. Uh, Betsy and or Lauren, we have talked about endorsement, endorsement, endorsement in so many of these different things. Is there a, is it laid out or dictated someplace where the endorsement process shall contain this, that, or the other thing? And who sets it? And how do we ensure that the endorsement process is either consistent or thorough enough that you're not just getting somebody sending five Xerox copies of something in and moving forward. Do you want me to take smiles, it? Everybody smiles. Mm -hmm. So um, usually in the endorsement process is set up um, by agency for OPR. Um, we have an endorsement application and the, the requirements are different by profession. So that they're, they're profession specific. One of the goals of this bill is to break down those profession specific requirements after five, three years of practice in another state. Yeah, and that's, I don't think the question. Um, okay, sorry. It's more like the, uh, you know, the Secretary of State's office has a bunch of investigators. Do they follow up on these things to verify that basically what you're seeing on the paper and are true and complete? Um, Yes. How, how are we making sure that the standard for the endorsement is, is factual? Yes. So we have a process that we use um, in any license application where our licensing specialists look at the documents that we receive and we follow up with a license verification with the, the other state. So if um, someone from New Hampshire applies for licensure, we independently do a third party verification with the other state that the license is in good standing. Does that answer your question? Yep, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So Betsy Ann, we have one other topic that we wanna to try to get to today. And so I'm wondering if we can maybe jog through and, and make note of the parts of the remaining 10 pages that uh, that are similar and uh, and come back to the ones that are anything different from what we've seen with the other professions. Sounds great. Okay, so I'll just point out section 15 is still in regard to the Board of Medical Practice. This is their uh, procedure to license by endorsement 
physicians based on three years of practice in another US jurisdiction. It's similar to the podiatrists where it's um, based on, they will do this based on whether you graduated from a US or Canadian med medical school and had at least two years of postgraduate training, or if you had a, uh, you're a graduate of a foreign school, at least three years of postgraduate training. Um, I'll just note also the Board of Medical Practice regulates radiologist assistants, anesthesiologist assistants, and physician assistants, but the board did um, provide feedback to Senate GovOps that the endorsement process was not um, appropriate or really wasn't something that happens for those professionals. So those three professions aren't included in there, um, just to make note of that. Um, there was language about them being able to waive the military fees and there's their pre-application determination. Um, I'll just note online or section 17, there's a one-off here on page 29 in regard to nursing um, where there is um, a tweak to the ability to get licensed as an LPN, a licensed practical nurse based on um, a program of study conducted in by the US Armed Forces. That's a one-off for this bill and then Finally, the bill gets into the plumbers. It's very uh, similar to the setup for the electricians. Um, I think there's nothing that distinguishes the, this language from the electricians board. If I'm recalling correctly, both the electricians board and professional and the plumbers board are under the Department of Public Safety. So it's that same language that we already reviewed in regard to electricians. Um, I'll just make a note again here on page 35. In section 21 is that requirement to adopt any of the necessary rules by July 1, 2021. And then finally, the last page is the effective date of July 1 of this year. Excellent. Any uh, remaining questions, burning questions for Betsy Ann on this? Bob still got his hand up from before, I think. All right, so just so that we all understand our plan with respect to this bill, we will come back to it at our committee meeting on Tuesday so that we can hear from the well drillers, uh, teachers, electricians, and plumbers. Um, and so we will come back to this uh, in a little more depth on those specific professions next week. So I um, want to thank uh, David Herlihy and Jessa Barnard for being with us today. Lauren, we appreciate you as always. Jason, thanks for setting the context of this bill. Um, and we are going to shift gears to a different bill right now. So you can stick around if you like, or you can sign off and be free from your computer for however much time. Betsy Ann, thank you so much for that. And we'll see you again on Tuesday. Thank you so Great. much. So we have, uh, Rob had to jump off for a few minutes and he is now coming back. And we have Maria Royal with us who can um, take us through again, the bill that we are working on with respect to communications union districts. Um, after we hear from Maria, then I will invite John Gannon to share with us the consideration that House Energy and Technology did on this language. So Maria, welcome. Hi, nice to be here, everyone. Maria Royal with Legislative Council. And Andrea, am I able to share the screen with you or are you able to pull up the document? Um, Let's go ahead and give you co-host. There you go. Look at that. Okay. Okay, can everybody see the document? Yes. Great. So I believe you've already kind of been through this, um, at, at least at the concept level and heard some testimony. Um, we'll go through it section by section. And I'm also just gonna highlight one substantive change um, so that you're aware of that. And it's really just a clarification and it's actually in the first section. So just to, um, as a little bit of a refresher, uh, these provisions all concern um, communications union districts, their formation and their initial appointments uh, to the district and also their initial organizational meeting. Um, so the first 
change. Let me just figure out the best way to scroll down here. There we go. Okay, so section one, this is specific to the formation of a CUD. And in fact, this is where the one substantive change uh, did occur. And that's the very on line 16, that very first phrase specifies for purposes of formation of a CUD. Um, this was just to make very clear uh, that again, this is as the formation process. Um, and then also this is just temporary authority um, for the duration of the state of emergency due to COVID-19. And this would allow the legislative body, for example, a select board of a municipality to form and enter into a CUD as opposed to requiring a vote either at an annual meeting or a special meeting um, involving all of the eligible voters of the municipality. So again, just temporary authority. Then sections two and three, we'll start with section two. This would be an amendment to the existing statute regarding the appointment of representatives and alternates to the, the district board. Um, so this is a permanent change. And you'll see that under existing law, those appointments would occur um, in the year following the effective date of the district's creation. So even if the district were able to form very quickly in the next month or two, because of this provision, they would not actually be able to appoint representatives to serve on the district board until the following year. So the proposal here is just to eliminate that um, timing requirement altogether uh, so that that doesn't come up in, in, in the future. Um, and then in terms of most of, most of the appointments are to serve one year terms. Um, so if you go down to line 13, there's some new language and it says that for initial appointments, um, they shall be made within 60 days of the vote to form a district and initial terms may be for less than one year. So again, this is just for initial appointment, appointments. In subsequent years, the timing, which is largely, I think revolves around town meeting, annual meetings, um, you get back onto that, that schedule of uh, April um, votes and so on. So again, that's a permanent change. And similarly, with respect to the first, the organizational meeting of the CUD, um, this uh, provides on lines, I'm on now page two, lines one through three, the board's initial organizational meeting shall be held within 90 days of the vote to form a district. Um, so again, uh, moving beyond the prescriptive timing requirements of the second Tuesday in May, which you can see on that, the very first words of this statutory section, um, at least for purposes of the initial organizational meeting. So this is just really to deal with some of the timing elements and that is pretty much it. The effective date is on passage. Thank you, Maria. Any questions from committee members about the words on the page? Jim Harrison. Maria, thank you for the overview. Um, if I may digress just a little bit. Um, Maria, I'm sorry that we didn't have March Madness this year, but I will say that your non-traditional approach to picking teams um, in the past probably would have served you very well. And I suspect that you would have been at the top of the heap uh, this year based on uh, the season that we had. Thank you. Well, I can't think of a greater reward or acknowledgement. Um, so I'm really pleased to hear <laughs> that. <laughs> Especially for some of others that have picked non-traditionally and have had great success consistently. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any uh, any other questions from committee members about the words? 
on the page. All right, I'm not seeing folks diving for their screen. So uh, stick with us, Maria, and we will go over to John Gannon now to um, ask you, John, to share with us your conversation with House Energy and Technology, who were the originators of the Communications Union District concept and bill. So thanks for joining them and reporting back to us. Sure. So, uh, I mean, uh, this, this chapter was part of a larger broadband, uh, broadband effort um, to encourage broadband um, across the state. And one of the ways to do that is through communication union districts, um, several of which have already been set up. And as we heard in our committee, you know, there's at least three study um, areas, um, one in Lamoille, one in Addison, and one in Rutland um, that are proposing to, to try to create um, CUDs, but are struggling with the voting requirements. Um, so I testified before House Energy and Technology yesterday morning. Um, I walked them through the changes. Um, their questions were just basic about understanding exactly what we're doing um, in this bill. Um, they did not um, present any concerns um, about these changes. Um, they were a little baffled as to how this comment, how the appointment had to be a year after the formation of the CUD um, ended up in the bill. Um, but that was their own <laughs> questioning of themselves, I think, rather than um, uh, what, what came into this bill. And um, they took a, a straw vote uh, and the vote was 10-01 um, with um, Representative Sherman being absent um, from the discussion. I'm not 10-0, um, it would be, what are, are they or seven? They're not an 11 member committee. Oh, um, I can't remember how many they have. Okay, well, everyone voted for it that was there um, and <laughs> Representative Sherman was not there. Okay, <laughs> great. So you don't have any red flags from them, which is good news. And yep. um, and I think that given that this is our, um, our one uh, immediate task in terms of COVID response bills, uh, I would love for us to get comfortable with the language here and ask any other questions we have of Maria who drafted it and then be prepared to move it on its way. So does anybody have questions? Jim. I don't have any questions, but when appropriate, I would move that we adopt this draft, whatever it is. Um, point three. I believe 1.3. Yes. Excellent. So we have a motion on the table. Any committee discussion on this? You know that we've looked at this language a few times already. So just want to make sure that we have a chance to uh, ask any remaining questions. All right. Nobody is diving towards the screen and I can see Marsha Gardner is getting ready with her roll call sheet as our clerk. Are you ready for me to start the roll? I believe we are. Okay. Gannon. Yes. Kitz Miller. Yes. Merlewicki. Yes. McClare. Yes. Harrison. Yes. Gardner, yes. Classic. Yes. Cooper. Yes. Brownell. Yes. Colston. Yes. Copeland Hansis. Yes. So the vote is eleven zero zero. Excellent. So I would love to have um, John Gannon report this on the floor and I appreciate your extra effort in making sure that energy and technology was aware of and comfortable with this as well and so if there are no remaining questions on this we will say thank you to Maria for being with us and move along thank you so much Maria it's very nice to see you hope you and your family are well great 
Okay, that is the end of what we have on our agenda for today. Next week, we will certainly be coming back to 233 because we need to um, not only hear from the other boards or professions who are um, mentioned in the bill, but also so that we can uh, give some time to the other committees who have jurisdiction over parts of the bill to weigh in on it as well. And then depending on what parts of the budget or the um, economic stimulus uh, proposal that the governor's putting on the table fall under our jurisdiction, we may shift gears back and forth between these licensing bills, um, 233 and 220 and uh, consideration of different parts of the budget proposal. So that is what I expect our task to be over the next couple of weeks. Anybody have questions, requests? Clarifications? All right, good deal. Okay, so uh, that is all that we have for today. Any, any announcements as a committee? Thank you.